Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me to this great workshop. Um, today, I'd like to explain what we can learn about um, gravitational uh, aspect using astrophysical objects, namely black holes and neutron stars, uh, mainly focusing on gravitational wave observations. Um, so uh, I would like to begin by showing this plot. Um, on the x-axis, it shows the amount of gravitational potential, and on the y-axis, it shows the amount of curvature for systems that have been used to probe gravity. Um, we know that solar system experiments have uh, done precise measurement and um, carried out tests of GR. Um, these green dots are some of the examples in this plane. Um, you can see that these solar system experiments lie rather on this bottom left corner, which means that uh, by using solar system experiments, we can only probe uh, somewhat weak field aspect of gravity, and that's because our sun is not uh, compact enough. On the other hand, we have uh, binary pulsars, which also allows us to do precision test of GR. Um, the system itself doesn't have large potential or large coverture. Um, they are somewhat similar to the sun, but the interesting point is they consist of pulsars with uh, neutron stars. So there are some observables where we can extract some information about uh, very compact um, gravitational uh, strong gravitational aspect, um, neutron star like here. So we can use binary pulse observations to uh, probe strong field aspect of gravity. Um, we also have Event Horizon Telescope uh, taking the image of a supermassive black hole. These are supermassive. Um, so the curvature is not so high, but since they are black holes, the potential is somewhere close to one. So you can do strong field test of gravity using uh, these uh, new images taken by the Enterprise and Telescope. On the other hand, gravitational wave sources, here I show the first event and the second event. They lie on this top right corner, meaning that they are truly strong field sources, but moreover, they are represented by lines, uh, which means that within the observation period of like 0.1 to 1 second, these systems with through hole of this range, meaning that these sources are not just strong field, but also dynamical. So this is what distinguishes uh, these new gravitational sources from all the other sources. So um, I'd like to use uh, these gravitational wave sources, binary black holes, binary neutron stars, or even black or neutron star events uh, together with some of the other electromagnetic observations of black holes and neutron stars. Like um, there is a system where main sequence um, has a black hole companion, and then they are forming a binary system. There is some accretion to the black hole forming accretion disk and X-ray emission, or there are pulsars measured by radio telescopes and also X-ray telescopes like NICER. Um, they have measured uh, compactness of a neutron star. So I'm going to explain how we can use these um, black hole and neutron observations to probe gravity and put this into context. I would like to focus on one class of uh, modified theory of gravity that was already introduced by um, LP on Friday, and that is the um, scalar gauss bonnet gravity. The action looks like this, where the first term is the um, usual GR einstein hilbert term, whereas the second term has the coupling between the scalar field phi and also this uh, gauss bonnet here in G, which consists of certain combination of uh, coverage squared. Um, the amount of coupling between scalar field and metric is represented by coupling constant alpha. I'm using the unit of C equals G equals one. And in that unit, this alpha has a unit of length squared. The third term is the kinetic term for the scalar field. And the last term is the matter Lagrangian. Um, field uh, okay. And uh, this is an interesting class because this coupling between uh, the scalar field and the uh, metric. There's an arbitrary functional form of phi. Um, and um, there are some examples that you can take. For example, if you set this f of phi to be just linear in phi, then this uh, theory reduces to shift symmetric scalar gas from gravity, meaning that even if you shift this scalar field by some constant amount, this um, theory remains um, invariant. Namely, this constant offset in the scalar field doesn't affect the field equation. Um, on the other hand, if you set this f of phi to be exponential of phi form, then this reduces to Einstein delta gas gravity that is motivated by a certain class of string theory. 
Um, you can also add potential, which I don't do in my talk, but you can. And if you do that, then you can explain, for example, inflational phenomena. Um, you can take some other forms like phi squared or exponential phi squared that will be uh, discussed. And for those uh, types, there are some interesting black hole phenomena. Then the field equations, uh, uh, since there's a scalar field and metric, there's one for the scalar field, one for the metric. The scalar field equation, it follows the wave equation where scalar field is sourced by this Gauss-Bonnet kind of invariant coupled to um, the scalar field. On the other hand, the Einstein equation is now modified um, due to terms. The first two terms corresponds to the stress energy tensor for the scalar field. And this additional term that has um, some complicated um, expression. This one comes from this additional term in the action. Okay, so we have a uh, wave recursion for the scalar field and also modified Einstein equation. Now, um, let's see. Um, and I am in this talk, I'm going to uh, mainly work in this shift symmetric version of the. Um, theory and for the following reason. Imagine that we have some asymptotic value for the scalar field at infinity, let's call that phi naught. For simplicity, we can set it to zero, but um, you don't have to set it to zero, it's just a constant. Um, but for simplicity, I'm going to set it to zero. Then we can think about Taylor expanding um, this f of phi function about this um, asymptotic value. And the leading is just a constant, the next leading is linear in phi, and then this uh, sequence keeps going. Now, um, this gas one invariant G is a topological invariant, uh, which means that this G can be rewritten as the total derivative of some current, um, which means that the leading piece, this constant piece, it becomes a total derivative term. And um, this typically doesn't contribute to the field equations. So um, the more interesting part is this second term that has linear coupling in phi, which doesn't um, become total derivative. So um, by keeping this term and then redefining this coupling constant, um, this second term in the action just uh, reduces to uh, linear coupling in phi times the gauss bonnet invariant. Uh, of course, there are higher order pieces that is ignored. So this is an approximation, but um, we are going to focus on this theory. And then we work in small coupling approximation, meaning that um, this alpha, the coupling constant, is much, much smaller than the mass squared of the system. Uh, we are doing this so that um, if, for example, we believe in string theory, then uh, if you reduce this 10-dimensional uh, action in string theory to four-dimensional action, then there could be other terms like alpha squared, alpha cubic order uh, entering, uh, which we are ignoring. So to um, make sure that those higher order terms don't contribute much to our analysis, we are making this small coupling approximation. Basically, we are assuming that any uh, corrections to GR are much smaller than the GR contribution. Um, of course, this is not um, a general uh, approach, and we are making this uh, approximation. Um, if you're interested in looking at f of phi to be like phi squared, then um, looking at this symmetric um, scalar gas one gravity is, is not valid. So this is restricting uh, our analysis. So basically we are focusing on what Helvey called type one class where F prime of zero is non-vanishing. If this F prime of zero is zero, then um, we have to do something else. Um, the interesting thing about this a type of theory where f prime of zero is non vanishing is because there are some hairy black hole solutions which allows us to have uh, black hole scalar charges. This is somewhat different from typical scalar tensor theories. Um, in scalar tensor theories, it's usually the case that neutron stars can have scalar charges, where black holes cannot have scalar charges due to uh, black hole no hair theorem. On the other hand, in the theory, it's the opposite. If you consider stars, including neutron stars, then scalar charges are highly suppressed. Um, it's effectively zero to the order that we are working on, whereas black holes can have non vanishing scalar charges. All right. Um, and my talk is um, somewhat complementary to uh, Helvis because um, Helvey was mainly focusing on numerical relativity simulations, which allows us to capture um, the phenomena during merger and also ring down. 
Whereas I'm going to focus on the inspire portion and also the ring down portion. Inspire portion, we can compute how the gravitation waveform gets modified from GR by using post Newtonian calculation. Whereas for the ring down, um, we can use black hole perturbation technique to uh, calculate, for example, how the quasi normal mode frequency gets modified from GR. So um, these two parts are what I'm going to focus on. Plus, I'm going to explain what kind of neutron observations we can use, how we can combine to do multi messenger uh, test of gravity. Okay, so I would like to split my talk into three parts. First part is just focusing on the inspire portion of the waveform for binary black holes. Or uh, black hole neutron star binaries and see how well we can test uh, this class of theory. Then I'll, I'd like to include the information of ring down. Um, to do that, we can, for example, do a consistency test where we take the inspire information. We also take marginal ring down information and compare the consistency between the two. And finally, if I have time, uh, I would like to uh, explain the multi messenger test for neutron star observations. Okay, I'm going to begin by the inspire test. Um, so let's um, imagine that there's a binary system with mass M1 and mass M2 orbiting around each other with vertical velocity V. In GR, um, we have gravitational wave emission whose luminosity goes like velocity to the 10th power. On the other hand, in this class of theory, um, these uh, black holes can have uh, scalar charges. Let's call that Q1 and Q2. Then this uh, multiple scalar charges induce scalar radiation, whose luminosity now goes as follows. It's proportional to the difference in the scalar charges squared and also velocity to the eighth power. The reason why there's a difference between the um, dependence in velocity is because gravitational radiation is quadrupolar, while scalar radiation is dipolar. So in terms of multipolar uh, expansion order, the scalar radiation enters actually at lower, post, uh, lower order. So you, if you convert this into post-Newtonian counting, uh, the scalar radiation enters at lower post-Newtonian order than the quadrupolar radiation. Um, this means that if you look at the uh, like orbital decay rate of some binary system, then this kind of theory predicts uh, a larger amount of uh, orbital decay effect because of the presence of this additional channel of radiation. And um, we can check this by looking at orbital decay measurement of some binary system. Typically, this is done using like binary pulsars, but in this class of theory, binary pulsars are not so useful because we need to have uh, at least one black hole in a binary system to um, see this kind of scalar radiation. And that's again, because neutron stars cannot have scalar charges or so star, binary neutron star system cannot have a scalar radiation. So uh, we need at least one black hole in a binary system. And there is such a system um, that I explained. It's called GOMA 6 ray binary system with uh, one object being black hole. Then um, there are some known systems where orbital decay has been measured, which is consistent with GR. So based on this fact, we can place an upper bound on the amount of coupling constant, because if the coupling constant is too large, then the emission of scalar radiation becomes too large. That the orbital decay rate measurement would be inconsistent with the actual measurement. So by taking this measurement, um, I placed an upper bound that square root of alpha, which has a unit of length, should be somewhere around two kilometers. Um, but now we also have gravitational wave events. So let's think about how to use those. Um, again, by taking the ratio between scalar radiation and gravitational radiation, we can work out um, how the uh, phase in gravitational wave get modified. Below is the schematic picture of a uh, binary in spiral. Um, the one in cyan is in GR, the one in Genta is in this theory, scalar gas point gravity. You see that there is a shift in the phase. There's also a change in the amplitude. And um, for scalar gas point gravity, the merger happens earlier because of the additional scalar radiation. Uh, Perhaps what's most important is to capture this difference in the phase because gravitational wave data analysis is sensitive to the change in the phase more uh, than the change in the amplitude. So that's what I'm showing here, how the phase gets modified from GR due to the scalar uh, dipole radiation. Um, this is a rough um, expression. 
Again, the correction is proportional to the difference in the scalar charges squared. And now the relative difference goes like velocity to minus two because scalar radiation uh, went as velocity to eight. Um, the gravitational radiation goes as velocity to the 10. So if you take the ratio, then scalar radiation is equal to V to minus two relative to GR. In terms of post-Newton counting, this we call as entering at minus one PN order. Um, again, scalar radiation enters of lower post order than in GR. So we can take this and then we can um, basically take a GR template and then modify the phase term by adding this leading post correction due to scalar radiation. Then we can compare the template against the actual events. And for binary black hole events, um, these uh, people have already done the analysis. Um, by using several binary black hole events, um, they obtain the probability distribution on the coupling constant. And um, the vertical line here shows the 90% credible upper bound. Uh, basically, what this plot is saying is that since uh, all the observed events are consistent with GR, we can place an upper bound on the square root of alpha to be somewhere like 1.7 kilometers. Now, since we have also black hole neutron star binary events, and since this system also contains one black hole at least, we can use these um, binary black hole neutron star merger events to also prove this kind of theory. Um, so together with a grad student at Perimeter Institute and uh, my own grad student at University of Virginia, John, um, we uh, redid the analysis by including neutron star black hole merger events. And then we obtained this red, um, this distribution for the uh, coupling constant. Now the upper bound shifted to this red vertical line from this blue one. So we have some slight improvement in the upper bound. And now the current upper bound is roughly uh, one kilometer ish. Now you might wonder um, why there's a peak here and also um, how valid this analysis is because um, so far we only included the leading um, post-Newton correction to the phase. And of course, there are higher order post-Newton corrections that we are ignoring. And those higher post-Newton terms can become important as the binary becomes closer and closer together, where relative velocity becomes faster and post-Newton approximation may break down. So um, to explain that, and uh, what you will see is that once we include those higher PN orders, then this peak will go away. So to do that, uh, we do need to derive um, correction to the phase at higher post order. Um, and uh, let's see, um, I'm, I'm gonna skip the details, but um, basically um, the phase correction can be expressed in this way, where um, K index here shows the uh, at which post order the correction enters and um, the ex actual expression I show on the right, which are mass, so you don't have to look this in detail. But my point is that, for example, the first one is the um, leading scalar dipole uh, effect, and then all the others are higher order IP and orders. And then um, this kind of analysis was done by Shirley et al. Uh, first, and then we uh, basically extended the analysis uh, to higher order by using the result of a scalar tensor theory results. Um, this expression is added to 1pn, which is here, at least for no-spinning um, no spinning uh, systems. On the other hand, at 1.5 and 2pn, um, there are some unknown uh, terms. So it's incomplete at uh, 1.5 and 2pn. Anyway, so we uh, found these uh, higher PN corrections to the waveform phase. So we did include um, these corrections and then we redid the analysis. And um, this plot shows the um, distribution non square root of alpha for um, this specific event GW200115. Um, this is black hole neutron star Bernier event. Um, the magenta one is the case where we we just include minus one p and leading uh, correction. Yes, the blue one includes all the way up to two p n corrections. And what you see here is first um, by adding higher p n corrections, since we have more pieces of information, um, the bound gets slightly stronger. 
uh, smaller value means stronger upper bound. Um, another thing to note is that uh, if you just include minus one PN correction, then there is uh, some peak in the probability distribution. Well, if you include higher PN corrections, then the peak goes away and now uh, close to square root of alpha being zero, it becomes more flat. And especially we have more weight uh, on this GR limit that square root of alpha being zero. So uh, by adding these higher post-Newtonian correction terms, the um, distribution becomes more consistent with GR. Okay, so um, higher PN corrections are not that important and um, those terms don't affect the upper bound by much, but um, they are important to um, get the correct uh, behavior uh, in the distribution of this coupling constant um, near the GR limit. Okay, um, then let me uh, show you one slide uh, showing the future forecast. Um, so here um, I'm assuming that future detectors uh, like ground-based detectors, Cosmic Explorer or Einstein Telescope or some space-based detectors like this Tygo um, detect signals coming from a neutron sub black hole variant system. I'm assuming the mass to be 1.4 solar mass or 10 solar mass um, located at one gigaparsecal away from us. Um, then um, let's see this plot, the uh, y-axis shows the upper bound on the coupling constant. And the current upper bound is somewhere here shown by this gray shaded region. Now, if we have these future detectors and if these events happen, then the upper bound improves um, by indicated it by these uh, blue triangles. For example, if we have this cycle, then we should be able to improve this by a factor, by a factor of, I don't know, 100 or so. Um, and we assumed this specific binary, but we will have more events. So we can even stack events to improve uh, this bound. Or if we have a much closer event or much smaller mass events, then they will also improve these bounds. Um, this one assumes that GR is the, the um, signal is consistent with GR, but what this plot is showing is that if the true theory is uh, this kind of modified theory of gravity, and if the true value of square root alpha lies somewhere uh, between this range, um, between below the current upper bound, but somewhere in this range, then the cycle will be able to see that effect. Okay, so um, that's um, what we can do in terms of in spiral. Now, um, let me move on and including the ring down correction. Um, so now uh, let's switch the gear and then let's think about what kind of consistency test we can do by using uh, inspire portion information together with margin ring down portion separately. And this has been done by the like of collaboration already. Um, and the idea is as follows. Okay, so split the waveform into two stages, inspire and margin ring down. Then from each of these portions, we estimate the initial masses and spins of uh, this binary black hole system. Now we can assume that GR is the correct theory of gravity with the numerical relative simulation result to infer the final mass and spin uh, from these initial mass and spin estimate. Then we check the consistency of the final mass and spin estimate uh, coming from the spiral and larger ring um, so this plot, um, the x-axis is final mass, the y-axis is final spin, and I'm going to show you um, the idea by using simple Fisher analysis. Um, so if we use all of inspire major ring down, then the error ellipse on this plane final mass and final spin becomes something like this green one, which is pretty small. On the other hand, if we just use the inspire portion, then since we um, truncate the signal at uh, somewhere at the end of the spiral, um, the error ellipse becomes much larger to this red one. On the other hand, if we use the margin ring down portion, then the error ellipse now becomes this blue one. So um, we can check the consistency between this red one and blue one. And basically, if there's an overlap between the two, then that means the assumption that GR is correct theory is consistent with the data. Um, this is a simple Fisher analysis just to show the, uh, for illustration purpose, but uh, the actual contours look like this one for GW15 by 14 obtained by the LIGO operation using actual data using full basic analysis. The dark magenta contour is obtained by just using spiral, whereas light magenta is obtained by using a margin ring down. 
And you can see that there's overlap between the two, meaning that the GR is consistent with the data. Um, there are um, two, at least two different controls. Um, we can try to combine these controls by moving to a different um, um, parameters. Namely, in this new plane on the right, um, the x-axis shows the difference in the final mass estimate between the uniform portion, the major uniform portion. The y-axis is somewhat similar, but for the final spin. If GR is correct, then uh, um, there shouldn't be any difference between the final mass and spin estimate coming from inspar portion, major ring down portion, because we are assuming that GR is correct. So uh, since our assumption is correct, there shouldn't be any difference between these two estimates. So the GR point in this plane corresponds to the origin. On the other hand, the data um, gives us this uh, single control in the 90% credible region. And the point here is that this control uh, includes this origin, the GR point. So again, what this is saying is that the GR, uh, the data is consistent with GR. And um, this kind of analysis was designed to do consistency, consistency tests, namely to check whether GR is correct or not. Um, but we can go one step further and then apply this to test some specific theory of gravity and try to extract some physical information. Um, so um, to do that, we need to have a correction to the inspired portion, but also in the marginal ring down portion. And um, to make um, calculations simple, uh, we've only included correction to the uh, ring down portion through black hole perturbation analysis. Um, to do this properly, we do need to include correction to the merger uh, phase by using the result of numerical relativity. Um, since there are some numerical relativity simulations available in scale against one gravity, but we don't have um, many runs done yet. Um, this part is uh, for future work. And for now, we just include correction to the inspiral, which I've already explained, and also the ring down portion, which I'm going to explain now. Um, so to get the correction to the ring down, especially correction to the quasi normal mode frequency, we can use black hole perturbation technique. Um, let me first uh, review how this is done in GR. So we take the background uh, metric to be the black hole solution in GR. If it's not rotating, then it's just simple Schwarzschild metric. Then we take this as a background. We part of the space time um, and we um, take up to linear order. Uh, we um, decompose the part of function into radial piece and um, circle harmonics and um, time component. And then if you just focus on the radial piece, then the radial black hole perturbation equations follow either the real equation or Reggie-Wheeler equation, depending on uh, which sector of even parity and odd parity you look at. Uh, for the even parity, it's called polar sector and it follows the real equation. For the odd parity, it's called axle part and it follows Reggie-Wheeler equation, uh, which has this nice and simple form. Um, X here is a new variable that's, that corresponds to total coordinate. Um, this perturbation equation is governed by this potential. Um, in this plot, I pick L equals two and then show the potential for both the polar mode and axial mode. Um, in this X coordinate, total coordinate, if you go to X, to, if you set X to infinity, then you're um, going to spatial infinity. If you set X to minus infinity, then you're approaching the black hole horizon. Um, you can see that the potentials look very similar to each other. Um, they're almost identical, but there's a slight difference between the two. Then to get QNM frequency, um, mega, you need to impose uh, appropriate boundary condition. And that is we want uh, only outgoing mode outside of the peak. And inside the peak, we only want uh, ingoing mode. Um, by imposing this boundary condition, we can solve this perturbation equation numerically to find this QNM frequency omega. Um, so many of the calculations are done numerically, but there are uh, several techniques known uh, where we can approximately find QNM frequencies analytically. And one approximation is called iconal approximation, which has has different names like double KP approximation, high frequency approximation, no geometrical optics approximation. 
Um, basically, we make an ansatz that the radial perturbation function has this form where we introduce this bookkeeping parameter epsilon on the phase, and we assume that epsilon is much smaller than one. Um, we are assuming that the frequency is uh, high enough. Then we plug these ansatz into the radial equation, the real equation, or regular equation. We um, perturb about epsilon equals zero and basically solve order by order. Then to leading order, if we assume that this harmonic uh, number L is much greater than one, then we can easily solve for this omega. The real part is given by uh, this nice and simple form, which depends on this effective potential U given by the TT component of the metric. Um, and also RM, which corresponds to the peak of the potential that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, in this approximation, the peak of the potential is at 3M, which coincides with the location of the light ring or the location of um, the photon um, going around a circle geodesic, uh, which is an unstable geodesic orbit. Um, so we do have this nice and analytic approximate uh, frequency expression. So you might wonder how good this approximation is compared to the actual numerical calculation. This red plot compares the analytic iconal result shown by this blue one against the numerical values shown by these uh, black dots, um, where the x axis is the harmonic L, the y axis is this real part of the frequency multiplied by the mass to make this quantity dimensionless. And what you see is that qualitatively, this analytic expression captures nicely the numerical result, although we do see some difference like 10% or 20%. So um, these don't give very, very precise result, but uh, qualitatively, this could be good enough and uh, this provides us a nice analytic estimate for QNM frequency. If, um, Another thing to note is that here, I uh, originally I show plus and minus to distinguish polar mode and uh, axial modes, or even parity and odd parity. But in this um, omega expression, I don't have plus and minus symbol, and that's because in GR we know that the polar and axial quasi normal mode frequencies are equivalent, and this is called isospectrality. Um, you will see that this nice feature gets broken in scalar gas one gravity. Um, this is for real frequency, but if we go to higher order iconal approximation, then we can find imaginary frequency as well, which I don't go into. Okay, so basically this is uh, how we can approximately find uh, QNM frequencies um, in GR. Now, uh, let's try to see whether we can apply this technique to um, scalar gas monogravity as well. Um, for scalar gas quantum gravity, things get slightly more complicated because the background metric is no longer Schwarzschild. Um, if you look at the TT component and R component, then we have the Schwarzschild component, but we also have corrections that goes like alpha squared on top of that. Since in this theory, we have scalar field, the scalar field has some background profile by bar. Um, so in this theory, we need to perturb not only the metric, about this new modified Schwarzschild background, but also uh, uh, we need to part of the scalar field phi about this background profile. Just like in GR, we can decompose this metric part into axial part and polar part. It turns out that the polar sector couples to the um, scalar sector. Um, so for the axial part, since this one is decoupled, we can actually follow through uh, similar analysis as in GR to find um, QNM frequencies even analytically, approximately using iconal approximation. And we can find um, <clears throat> correction to GR frequency for the axial part uh, relatively straightforward. Um, more interesting part is this uh, polar sector, which is coupled to this scalar field. Um, the schematic form of the uh, perturbation equations look like these, where k hat corresponds to one of the metric perturbations in the polar sector, while phi hat corresponds to the scalar perturbation. And you can see that the first equation is the one for the metric perturbation, but this one is sourced by the scalar perturbation. And the second one is the scalar perturbation equation, which is now sourced by the metric perturbation. So that's what I mean by this 
to uh, perturbation being coupled to each other. Um, so this makes the analysis a bit more complicated, but we can still uh, perform the analysis of, and uh, these equations are again governed by some potential, uh, which I show here as a function of R, um, the um, Schwarzschild radius and Schwarzschild coordinate. And then uh, the blue one is the case where I set the coupling constant to zero. So the blue one corresponds to the GR potentials. And then if I increase the potential, sorry, if I increase the coupling constant, then the peak uh, location, sorry, the peak um, decreases as you see in this plot. Okay, um, we can still follow through the um, icona analysis. And then uh, we do get correction to the um, um, real part and imaginary part of the frequencies like this one. And what we are seeing here is that now, um, there are, since there are two perturbations coupled, there are actually two independent um, frequency modes. Um, and one corresponds to the scalar-led mode. The other one is called gravity-led mode. Okay, so there are three uh, frequencies involved now in this scalar gas one gravity axle mode and polar gravity led mode and also polar scalar led mode. So to see how they compare with the um, uh, with each other and also how they depend on the coupling constant in this plot, I choose specifically the exponential phi coupling, which corresponds to Einstein delta gas body gravity. And I show um, how the real part of the frequency changes as a function of constant alpha. On the y-axis, I normalize the uh, real part of the QNM frequency by the Schwarzschild one. So um, basically in GR, we just have one. Then we see three different colors. Um, the green one corresponds to the axle mode. The blue one corresponds to the polar gravity led mode, while the red one corresponds to the polar scalar led mode. The dots are the ones obtained numerically that has been computed by these people, whereas the solid ones are the ones obtained analytically using iconal approximation. The iconal approximation, um, as I said earlier, we assume that um, this coupling constant is much smaller than the mass squared of the black hole. So um, this iconal approximation is only valid when coupling is small, which is what we are seeing here, that when alpha is small, the difference between the solid one and um, dots are pretty small. Whereas if I increase alpha, then the deviation becomes much larger, um, which is, basically because of the um, breakdown of this uh, approximation that we are making. Um, and another interesting thing to note is that um, for fixed alpha, we see three different uh, frequencies, especially we see a difference in the axle um, mode and also polar gravity lead mode, which signals the breakdown of the isospectrality. So there are a few different uh, frequency modes involved in this um, new theory, but um, this is how the correction to the um, kind of frequency enters in the scalar gas monography. So, now that we have correction to the QNM frequency in the ringtone portion, we can use that information and we can also use the correction to the gravitational waveform phase that I showed you earlier in the inspired portion. Um, and we can do the analysis and then we can do the consistency test between the um, final mass and final spin estimate. I skip uh, the technical details and I just show you the result. Um, this Plane again shows the um, difference in the final mass estimate between inspiral and larger ring down on the x axis. On the y axis, I show something similar, but for the final spin. Um, I'm assuming that um, in future, Cosmic Explorer and LISA both see signals coming from GW15 on a 14 like event. So, this is what we call multi band ast astronomy, where um, at first, LISA sees the signal, and then maybe four or five years later, Cosmic Explorer sees the same as the signal coming from the same source. Um, if this kind of uh, situation is realized, 
And if GR is the correct theory of gravity, then um, this black contour is the area ellipse that we find um, by um, doing this consistency analysis. Okay, and now uh, let's imagine that in reality it's the um, einstein delta gauss pony gravity that's uh, the correct theory, but we are assuming that GR is correct and we are using GR template to recover um, the information. And then we will start to see some inconsistency. For example, if we inject a signal with uh, EGGB correction with a coupling set to 0.2 kilometer, then the, this area ellipse now uh, shifts down to this red one. Um, this red one is still consistent with the GR prediction, uh, which is here at the origin, because this red one still includes the GR point. But now you see that the cent central point of this ellipse has deviated away from this um, GR prediction point. If I further increase this coupling constant, then now um, this blue area ellipse is totally off from the GR prediction. So if we see this, then this is an indication that some of the assumptions that we made is incorrect. And one assumption is that GR is correct. So maybe the signals that uh, GR, um, GR assumption is inconsistent with the data. On the other hand, if we see that our data is consistent with GR, then we can place an app bound that um, the square root of alpha should be smaller than 0.2 kilometer, because if the coupling constant is above this number, then we sh should see um, inconsistency signal. Right. Um, okay, so I will quickly try to go through the multi-messenger test. Now, um, let's think about what we can, uh, how we can use neutron star observations to prove this scalar gas one in gravity. Um, we have gravitational wave um, by the neutron star merger event, GW 717, associated with electromagnetic counterparts. We have X rays observing um, like um, hot X rays from hot spots on a rotating pulsar. We also have radio telescopes uh, finding uh, interesting pulsars. Um, and this is the mass radius plane and uh, showing how each of those radio X ray and gravitational wave observations allow us to. Um, measure masses and radius. So for radio uh, telescopes, they have found some uh, interesting pulsars with masses roughly about two solar mass. So that's shown by this gray shaded region. On the other hand, GW 7217, um, they have measured uh, tidal deformability and that information can be mapped to mass radius information, which are <laughs> shown by this blue contour and red contour for the primary neutron star and secondary neutron star. For the X-ray, NICER has observed X-rays coming from hotspots of this rotating pulsar. The mass radius contour is shown by these uh, black contours. Okay, so we can try to use these um, pieces of information and prove um, gravity. So, for example, we can use mass radius relation. Um, to uh, probe gravity, um, taking scalar gas pony gravity as an example. Here I show the, how the mass radius relation changes from GR in solid to scalar gas pony gravity in dashed. Um, since neutron stars depend on the internal structure, which are controlled by the equation state, um, here we chose uh, roughly 10 different equations of state. And for each equation of state, we computed the mass radius relation. Uh, in scalar gas pony gravity, which depends on what kind of coupling constant you choose. Here we chose a coupling constant such that um, the relation is marginally consistent with the two solar mass bound. Namely, if we increase this alpha, then the maximum mass gets suppressed. So if we make this alpha to be too large, then the maximum mass becomes below two solar mass, which is inconsistent with the radio observation. So uh, we chose our alpha to be such that the maximum mass is basically two solar mass. Um, this means that since um, if we increase alpha too much, uh, this will become inconsistent with measurement. So we can place up bound on this alpha from this two solar mass measurement, which depends on which equation state you pick. Um, so 
if we pick the stiffest equation state that tends to give us the most conservative bound, we found that uh, square root of alpha is uh, should be smaller than 1.3 kilometers, which is roughly the same as the gravitational wave bound that I showed you earlier. Although this bound uh, depends on the equilibrium state. Um, and if we have chosen some more uh, somewhat stiffer equilibrium state, then this bound will change. So as an order of magnitude, this bound should still hold, but um, quantitatively, this bound depends on quantum state. So there's some uncertainty here. Um, so it would be nice if we can do um, this kind of test of GR without being affected by uncertainties in, in nuclear physics. So um, in an equation state insensitive way. So to do that, um, there is one interesting relation that we can use, which is um, basically the relation between the compactness and also tidal deformability or tidal lab number. Compactness is um, the ratio between mass and radius of a neutron star, whereas tidal deformability is a ratio between the tidal induced quadrupole moment to the external tidal field strength, which are already introduced by Tanya and Eric. Um, and what you're seeing here is that um, depending on which equation state you choose, you get slightly different curves in this um, tidal deformability versus compactness plane. But um, the relation, the variation is uh, quite small. So we call this kind of relation equation state insensitive or quasi universal. And um, the yellow shaded region here, I show the um, compactness measurement for 1.4 solar mass neutron star coming from NICER and the tidal deformability measurement of uh, 1.4 solar mass neutron star coming from LIGO variable measurement through gravitational waves. And um, the GR relation goes through the um, measure, measured error box. So this means that the GR is consistent with the measurement. This relation, we assume GR is correct, but if you go beyond GR, then the relation uh, gets shifted around. So um, we took scalar gas from gravity as an example, and then we constructed neutron star solutions. We extracted um, these quantities, and then we plot one against the other for various equation state. And the relations are shown now by these new colored um, curves. We see that there is indeed deviation away from the GR prediction, but in this interesting regime where observation has been made, unfortunately, the deviation is too small that um, is, it looks like right now it's difficult to constrain this theory through a uh, love simulation. Now uh, through this kind of universal relation. On the other hand, in the future, if we have um, measurement of compactness and tidal deformability for re uh, high mass neutron stars somewhere around here, then if the measurement is good enough, maybe we can um, prove this kind of theory well. Um, I'd like to mention that yesterday there was a very, very interesting talk by Eric Poisson on ambiguity of the tidal deformability um, calculation. And um, here, when we compute, extracted this tidal deformability in this theory, uh, we didn't go through um, the analysis that Eric mentioned of using post neutron technique to match the simple expansion and so on to remove the ambiguity. Here, we uh, basically made one choice of how we identify growing modes to um, extract the tidal field and identify the decay mode to extract the tidal into the part of the moment. We just followed uh, what has been done typically in GR, but um, that may not be the case in scalar gas one gravity. So just one comment that um, there is still ambiguity uh, remained in this calculation. So we need to do more sophisticated analysis to remove that ambiguity. Um, so this result should be taken as an approximation. Okay. Um, so that's for the uh, scalar gas phonic gravity using uh, love C relation, but there are some other uh, universal relations that we can use. Uh, for example, there's no universal relation between moment of inertia, spin induced quadruple moment, and the tidal deformability, tidal love number. And um, these, uh, what we call I love Q relations, the equation set variation is actually much smaller than the love C relation that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, and um, so we can, in principle, use um, these. Unfortunately, 
Out of these, it's only the tidal deformability that has been measured so far, but in the future, um, we hope that uh, moment of inertia of the primary pulsar inside the double pulsar binary system can be measured maybe to 10% accuracy. So far, um, radio people have placed up a bound on the um, moment of inertia of the primary pulsar, but um, um, there, there's no lower bound yet, so there's no actual measurement, but uh, they are getting there. So uh, here, what we assume is that moment of inertia can be measured to 10% accuracy in the future as gravitational wave observations, but has to measure the tidal deformability to 40%. Then, just like in the lab C case, we can uh, plot this um, measurement error, and then the GR relation is here, which is equation state insensitive, then um, we, let's see, again, if we choose some different theory of gravity, we will see a deviation from GR. We haven't computed this moment of inertia and scalar gas point gravity, but here I show a theory that's cousin to um, scalar gas point gravity, which is dynamical transcendence gravity, that also has a scalar, uh, sorry, has a curvature squared correction to the action, but it's a pretty violating effect due to contrariating invariant um, term. Um, anyway, so the point here is that um, there is one coupling constant in this theory, and I have chosen the coupling constant such that the new relation becomes marginally consistent with this hypothetical measurement in the future. And that coupling constant is million times smaller than the bound coming from solar system experiments, meaning that if this kind of um, observation is realized, then we should be able to place medium times stronger bounds in this kind of party violation through uh, multi-messenger observations of neutron stars together with the use of universal relation. Okay, I think I'm running out of time, so uh, let me conclude. So we mainly focus on testing um, string inspired gravity, uh, namely scalar gas point gravity using uh, black hole and neutron stars. If you use gravitational wave observations, then we derive the strongest bound by combining binary black hole events by uh, black hole neutron star merger events. And then uh, I gave some future forecasts that the bounds should improve by one to two orders of magnitude. Um, for neutron stars, Similar um, bound can be obtained from uh, mass radio relations, but those are equilibrium state sensitive, and there are equilibrium state insensitive way of probing gravity through universal relations. For scalar gas point gravity, unfortunately, it's difficult, but um, those kind of universal relations can be useful to probe, for example, the aspect of parity violation in gravity. Okay, um, I'd like to stop here, and then I'd be happy to address any questions uh, if there are any. Thank you.